Megan Fox was recently on the Call Her Daddy podcast and she talked about plastic surgery, so let's react. And we did an analysis of Megan Fox's potential facial plastic procedures a few years ago. Can we just talk about plastic surgery yeah, since we're on this? Yeah, let's talk, yeah. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through all the things that I've done. Love. I gotta incorporate that into my vernacular. Love, <laughs> that's cool. I'm gonna do this, I'm not gonna win. Okay. However, I'm hoping it sets some people free. Let's go. Some of my favorite comments are from women and I don't often read them, but sometimes I'm in the mood and I'm like, I wanna interact with a troll. Yes. And it takes one second for them to start pouring into my Instagram feed or my, my comments. And they're often from women where I'll be like, that is a particularly cruel thing to say. Who is this person? And I'll click on it and she'll be like, women's life coach, crystal healing, loving God, tantric lessons. Yeah, I feel like some women are pretty cruel to other women. And I don't know if that's just like, a you know, I want to one up, you know, my uh, competition or whatever it is. But surely also there's the... Um, added, you know, complexity of her being a celebrity. And uh, listen, people want to know. They want to know. And some people get upset if they see something that looks like it was obviously manipulated or, you know, some some changes were done to, say, the body or the face. And then the celebrity doesn't want to talk about it. And that could be manipulation with Photoshop. It could be manipulation surgically or with makeup. And if they're not told about it, you know, they, they get uh, upset by that. She can't win, right? E even if she admits to things, people are still going to speculate. They might doubt what she says whatever so you can't win but it, it's great that she's decided to be more upfront we'll see what she has to say but that if you were to ask her she would be like well that's because she perpetuates an unhealthy standard of beauty right mm -hmm. but and so here i am i'm going to be fully transparent mm -hmm. i still won't win because there are some girls who have been who have been transparent i don't want to like bring people yeah. in but someone like a kylie has been very transparent well i mean i think kylie's admitted to certain things like the lip filler like i think it was a breast augmentation procedure that she admitted to but surely i think most agree that she hasn't been transparent about all the different procedures that she may have had right and so that's some of the issue that I sometimes have with, with celebrities and, and, you know, just in general, that people are more willing to admit certain things, but not others. And for some reason, when it comes to the face, people get really extra personal about that. They don't want to discuss every facial plastics procedure that they had, but they might say, oh, I got you know, breast augmentation or I got a tummy tuck or something like that. Somehow elsewhere on the body, it seems a little less personal than on the face. So that's like partial truth. That's not the full truth if you're only admitting to a few procedures. Now, there's the flip side of all this, which is to say that, you know, what about patient privacy? At the end of the day, these celebrities are just people and shouldn't we respect their privacy and not talk about all of this stuff? There is I think some truth to that as well. But the problem is that because they're in the public eye and because so many people are influenced by them, especially, you know, younger people who make many life decisions based off of what their favorite celebrities do, whether that's right or wrong, because of that influence that they wield, I think it's very important that in many cases that they be, you know, more transparent than they are today. So it seems like Megan Fox is heading in that direction. So let's keep watching. Here's things I haven't done that I have been accused of doing. Okay. And then I'll confirm the things I have done. Okay. I've never had a facelift of any kind. Okay. Okay. So I'm looking back at my analysis of Megan. I did speculate on a potential facelift procedure around 2020, 2021, but I do have a question mark next to that. I wasn't really totally sold on it based on the images that I reviewed. So I think it's very fair, you know, now that I look back at some of these images that, you know, perhaps she may have had something like Sculptra over the years to kind of firm up the tissue without necessarily getting um, a facelift. And she's still quite young. She's still in her 30s. So I think that's very possible that um, she has not had a facelift by now. No mid facelift, no like lateral brow lift. You know, she did start off with brows that were already positioned fairly high. So I can believe that, that perhaps she never needed to get them lifted because they just stayed up there. So, you know, um, I think there's likely truth to that as well. I've never done threads. I have researched them. That's not because of some moral thing. 
I just don't really believe they work. And I'm also afraid that they would interfere when I do need to have a facelift. Mm -hmm. But I am very tempted to go have my eyebrows snatched like all the way. I want I want that look sometimes. What she's getting at there is that threads do have the potential to form scar tissue. That makes it more difficult when you're going in surgically to lift those tissues and to find your planes. So she is right in that prior thread lifting or other types of lifting modalities that are non-invasive like radio frequency energy can also create scar tissue that makes it harder to do the actual facelift when it's time to do that. And you can do it on a lunch break and I see why it's so tempting and I, I have researched it, have not done it yet. Not something you want to do during a lunch break because you are going to get swelling, you are going to get bruising to those areas where the threads are placed. And it does have some complications as well, such as nodule formation, such as dimpling of the tissue, infection. You know, there are real potential complications of thread lifts as well. I've never had this done. What is this? Oh, buck buckle fat? Buckle fat? Buckle, buckle fat? Buckle fat? I've never had that done. And that was not on my list of potential things that she had done um, in the past, but um, it's good for her to clarify that because by now, many celebrities in Hollywood have done the buckle fat removal and it continues to be a trend and we have many videos about that procedure and why in many cases I think it's not the right surgery for most patients. I'm a very like lean person that doesn't have enough body fat or fat in my face so I will only ever put fat in I will never be taking fat out yeah I mean that's very forward thinking because some people will get the buckle fat removal when they're you know in their 20s or 30s and then when they're much older they wish that they never had that buckle fat removed because it's hard to get it back even if you later on do a fat transfer you can't exactly fat transfer that specific compartment so that's the problem with um, these buckle fat removal surgeries I've never had any like liposuction or body contouring or anything like that i've never had what are other things you can have butt implants i mean i BBL. i would be so flattered if somebody thought i had a bbl <laughs> if i could i would i i don't have Damn. i don't have the extra body fat i would get it done if i could that dump and truck she probably can still get it done but also remember bbl is a fairly high risk procedure compared to other cosmetic surgeries because of the potential for fat embolus so it's much safer to just avoid it you know people die from that surgery um every year so yeah I think that that's good on her. That surgery is such a hard one to recover from. It's so insane. Oh. It's basically like three months you have to lay flat on your face. I could never You're be You're bruised for an eternity. The truth is that all surgeries have some recovery time associated with them. It usually does take at least three months for things to start to normalize, whether it's a facelift, a rhinoplasty, you know, a lip lift surgery, a hair transplant. Like it all takes time for people to start to, you know, look more normal, to, to feel more normal. And it can take a year or more for for like full surgical recovery from pretty much any surgery. So what she's describing is maybe more specific to BBL procedures, but other plastic surgeries also require extended periods of time to feel better. And that's something that a lot of people I think are not fully aware of when they're, you know, going and signing up for something. They think that it's more like maybe a week or two and everything will be perfect, but then they soon discover that's really not the case. You have to be prepared for that type of uh, recovery. I would be like, if I'm going to survive that surgery, you're going to give me and it's like an anomaly. Like I'm you're, I'm gonna walk through a park and I'm gonna turn around and everyone is gonna be whispering and laughing and talking because they're like, what, Damn. what are we looking at? You know, some folks who get these BBLs, they start to look like those ants with like the big uh, behinds. So I'm not really sure that's the optimal look, but, but I think some people are into it. When in the future, you can take donated fat from people, I will be doing that. Well, it doesn't quite work like that because when you take fat from somebody else and you put it into your own body, your body is going to reject that fat. It's going to see it as foreign material and it won't survive. And I get that question a lot with hair transplants. Like, can I take someone else's hair, put it on my hair? Um, no, unless it's like an identical twin with the exact genetic match. But I don't think that twin is probably going to have a similar uh, hair loss problem. It's not going to give you the hair. What I have had done, like I said, I had my boobs done when I was 21 or 22. Uh -huh. I had them redone after I was done breastfeeding my kids mm -hmm. because I don't know where they went, but they went. And then I had to have them redone very recently because the first set 
I didn't have enough body fat to disguise. You could see the rippling of the implant. So I had to switch. We get a lot of questions about breast augmentation. And normally my answer is, well, I'm not necessarily your guy to answer that because I'm a facial plastic surgeon, right? But we did have Dr. David Hidalgo in the office recently doing a podcast with me. And in that podcast, he answers many of your breast surgery questions. So make sure to check out that podcast. I don't like surgery. My body does not react well to general anesthesia. Okay. So keep in mind that not all surgery surgery is performed under general anesthesia, including plastic surgery. For example, when I do my hair transplant surgeries and my lip lift surgeries, those are done under local anesthesia most of the time. Sometimes we'll do them under some degree of IV sedation, which is still not technically considered general anesthesia. Depends, you know, there's kind of a, a continuum there. However, when I do a surgical hairline advancement or a forehead reduction, we usually have the patient under IV sedation. So they're still breathing on their own, but they're under for example, like propofol. So they don't have a recollection of the events and they're very comfortable. So there are these gradients of um, how deep you can go into anesthesia when you're getting plastic surgery. And the medications that are used for something like IV sedation can be quite different from general anesthesia. For general anesthesia, you're usually going to get an inhalational gas and some people don't respond well to that gas. But in terms of propofol and IV sedation, most people do quite well. And of course that has to be administered and monitored by an anesthesiologist. When I go to have a surgery, it's a very big deal. All my doctors have to meet with me before and have to tell me if they've seen any omens, if they saw any owls, crows, if anyone stepped on a spider, if any, if there are any dead insects. Like my doctors have to go through this. I can't tell if she's joking around here or if she's actually coming to the doctors with like a, a list of, um, you know, kind of a checklist. Did you see this? Did you see that? That's not something that we commonly get from our patients, but I have had some interesting questions, you know, over the years, but never one quite like this. Because I'm very afraid of dying under general anesthesia. So I don't take surgery lightly and therefore I have not had many of them because of that. That's very fair. You know, I think every time you go under especially general anesthesia, there are inherent anesthetic risks, forget about the actual surgery, but just the risk of being under general anesthesia. And that shouldn't be taken lightly because each time, you know, you put yourself at risk for some sort of cardiovascular event or something. It is a big deal. And also for cosmetic surgery in particular, many of these procedures are being done in like private settings, not necessarily in like big hospitals where there's a lot of support, but it'll be like in private operating room, for example. So like if something bad were to happen, it might take longer for the person to get the emergency services that they might need. So that again, um, makes things even more in a way dangerous and more complicated. Generally, it's very safe but there are real risks. And the more that you're under general anesthesia compared to say local anesthesia with some oral sedation, I mean, that is going to change the risk profile for the procedure. So that's probably a saving grace that I have this paranoia or this fear because God knows what I would have been up to. Do your doctors think you're insane? Well, even if they do, they probably don't tell her that. Yes, I saw an owl, Megan, let's reschedule. No, we, all, we all, and by the way, I'm like, I'll still pay for the surgery. Just do not also make sure the music playlist, no music comes up that reminds you of like your ex-girlfriend or an ex-wife or anything that's going to make you upset because you are the surgeon. I mean, she's saying a lot of things here and some of it is just, you know, I think meant to be funny maybe. Um, some is very serious, but it's a great point that she brings up that like she wants to make sure that the surgeon is first and foremost, you know, comfortable as ready for the day and for the surgery as, as possible. And, you know, even like the playlist, right? Because when I'm operating, especially under local anesthesia, some patients, you know, they want to listen to their music, you know, on, on the loudspeakers. And I try to remind them that I need to be in the right state of mind to do so. Like I had one guy recently for a hair transplant and he wanted to listen to heavy metal. Well, I don't really like heavy metal and I can't concentrate and focus and do a great job with the surgery if I'm listening to music that doesn't make me comfortable. So um, I told him that and I think he sort of understood. And, you know, it's great that she's thinking about it like, from that perspective, like if I make sure that my surgeon is as comfortable as he or she can be, then they'll probably optimize the the chance for success of my own surgery. So she's she's very smart and, and very good at pointing that out. You need to be in a good headspace. If you have a fight with your wife, do not come in for surgery. I go through all of these protocols. You should make us all like a list of like I, a little pre-op you situation. You don't want to, any surgery is a risk to your life. I don't care what anyone says. Right. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Going under general anesthesia is a risk 
risk to your life. And again, I'll just say here as a caveat that not all plastic surgery is done under general anesthesia, but for certain procedures, for example, you know, like a breast augmentation, that's almost always done under general. So that's probably why she keeps bringing up general anesthesia, but many procedures can be done without general. When I had to go in for this set, I was like, look, if you're going to put me to sleep, if I'm going to be sick for two months from the general anesthesia. Well, two months of being sick after general, that's an exaggeration. Uh, most people, you know, after a day or two are sort of back to normal when it comes to how they feel from general. Two months would be a really, really extended period of time. At that point, it's like, did she have some weird allergic reaction to something? I'm not sure, but most people don't take it that long to recover from the general anesthesia portion of it. I'm not fully ever asleep. So my soul's like fighting on the surgical table to wake up. It's a very traumatizing experience for me. There are people who actually wake up during surgery, but I think that's different from what she's describing. I think she's out, but her soul is not, you know, whatever that means. But there are people who wake up from anesthesia and they remember exactly what happened to them and even some of the discomfort that they felt. And that's kind of alarming. But, you know, nowadays, most anesthesiologists know what signs to look for to make sure that you're fully comfortable and not remembering the events of the actual surgery. I was like, I better wake up with the biggest boobs you can fit in my body. <laughs> and that is what he said he did. And they're not even that big. They're a 32D, which is not that big. They just look big on my body because my body's tiny. Right. And then um, I had my nose done when I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So looking back at my notes from before, I mean, I have her as potentially having a rhinoplasty right around age 23. So that's in line with what she's saying. With the rhinoplasty, she had a narrowing of her bridge and the nasal tip. And also the tip cleft was resolved after that rhinoplasty. So maybe they put in a little uh, soft tissue graft to smooth out that transition from one side of the lower lateral cartilage to the other. But that's something I noticed. Also, the nostril show increased and that was a clue. It seems like she's confirming that procedure. I've literally been accused of having like six, seven, eight rhinoplasty surgeries, which is impossible. Your nose would get necrosis and fall off. <laughs> yeah. And I actually said that I think she only had one. So that's right in line with what she's saying. I haven't had a rhinoplasty since I was, I'm going to say 23. It's been well over okay, a decade. Okay. I haven't, I've not touched my nose since then. I was right about that one. This is fun. I wish that all the celebrities went on, whether it's call her daddy, or I wish they'd come to me onto my podcast and we can just like talk it out and see what's true, what's not true and uh, set the record straight. I mean, that would be super fun. And I actually... <laughs> On uh, the X platform, I uh, added Elon Musk recently and I was like, come on over. Let's talk about, you know, your hair journey and your hair transformation. I mean, clearly something happened. I mean, I think most people agree that his hair did change at a certain point and they have a whole video about it. But it'd be amazing to break it down and to see what's true, what's not true. A lot of people would get great benefit from that. So maybe one day he'll reply. We didn't contour my nose. This <laughs> We didn't no, contour did. my nose. No, we didn't. You we didn't contour Jenna, it. you're fired. Should we oh, she's pissed at her makeup team now. Your nose no. looks... No. I can make it tiny like a little elven princess. I make it so small. Within within one inch of its life, I contour it. I mean, I think her nose already looks fairly narrow. I don't know how much smaller it needs to be. But the point is that the makeup that people wear surely really changes their appearance. And sometimes we might see some plastic surgery signs, but it's really just different makeup. And I'm really careful when I analyze, um, you know, faces to look for just makeup changes versus actual kind of different contour changes that are like surgical contours as opposed to just a makeup contour. But it's difficult sometimes. And so she brings up a great point there too, that you can do a lot with just makeup alone. I can't believe I'm doing an interview without nose contour on. I'm traumatized. You don't understand what a big deal this is. No, this no, is no. like me not having done my eyebrows. It's very scary for me. I like to contour it down until it's just nostrils like Voldemort. Can just no <laughs> nose, just. Well, there is that uh, alien, the black alien guy, and he just has two nostrils. Uh, he just got his nose amputated. That's one way to do it, but I don't think she's uh, looking to do that. And remember, you need some structure to your nose to be able to breathe normally through it. So every time people get a rhinoplasty to make it smaller, 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 in many ways, they're reducing their nasal airflow. So there's always 
with this balancing act, the smaller you make the nose, the more difficult it is to breathe. The bigger you make the nose and throw in lots of graphs and give it a lot of structure, well, you might be breathing better, but now your nose might look too big. So it's great when you can get it just right, where when you have enough structure there, but you can still, you know, breathe well and it looks great. But that's that's what makes rhinoplasty so challenging. You look so gorgeous. You're gonna keep going. This is good for you. This is good for you. She's gotta keep going. Okay. So you've had your nose done, you've had your t- done, and what? Botox and filler? That's, yeah, that's it, right? Yeah, I mean, Botox and filler, you know, pretty much commonplace, not just in Hollywood, but, you know, throughout. So no surprises there. And we had her down for Botox and filler back in our uh, video as well. There's one thing I had done that I'm gatekeeping because... <gasps> Yeah, so I heard about this. There was this one procedure that she didn't really want to elaborate on that she said she had done. And then I watched a reaction video from my good friend Lori Hill, a fellow YouTuber, really has awesome analyses as well. And make sure to check out her channel if you're not familiar with it. But in Lori's video, she's speculating that perhaps it's an eyebrow hair transplant that Megan had and that maybe that's the procedure that she's not uh, comfortable revealing or just doesn't want to get into. So I did a deeper dive into that to see if maybe, you know, that could be it. Because as you guys know, I do eyebrow hair transplants quite often in the practice. So let's take a look. So looking at Megan Fox's eyebrows, when she was 18 to 20 years old, they appear quite thin. And I think this probably was from overplucking the brows. But as we know, when you overpluck, sometimes the hair doesn't fully grow back. And we have a video about that compared to, say, shaving the brows. You know, it's different when you shave the eyebrows for people who want to do that. The eyebrows tend to grow back just fine. But if you pluck out the brows, they usually don't grow back if you do it repeatedly. Then when Megan was about 21 to about 34 years old, she had her eyebrows appearing thicker. And I think that was partly because of the use of tattoo or makeup. And the head of the brow is just medial to the medial canthus of the eye around that window of time. And that is a pretty standard aesthetic. But then when you look at her from ages 35 to 36, it's different now. I think she was starting to get some microblading done around that time. You see these like stroke lines that are visible at the inferior edge of the brows. And the head of the brows are now extended more medially. So towards the center of her face, they come closer together. And then around the age of 37, so this was just last year, 2023, I think she may have had an eyebrow hair transplant. So I would agree with Lori here. I think she used the eyebrow hair transplant to cover up some of the prior tattooing and the microblading work. You can see that the hair appears more coarse. And that's because when we take hair from the back of the head, which is where, you know, we harvest the hair or where the donor area is for the eyebrows, that hair tends to be more coarse. So when you bring it over to the eyebrows, it's never quite as fine as the original brow hairs. And remember that hair that's brought in from the back of the head, it's going to grow long. So it requires regular maintenance. So you have to be trimming those hairs at least every two weeks. Most people trim at least every week. So you can see some of those longer hairs there, especially at the head of the brow. And there's a lot of this fullness in her brow. So I think this was work that was well done, but you can see a clear difference from, let's say, when she was 19 to how she looks now at age 37 you can really see that transformation. And I think that it's not just makeup. So I would agree that it looks like an eyebrow hair transplant was probably performed around 2023. Thank you, Megan Fox, for being transparent about your plastic surgeries and being vulnerable about the entire process. And make sure to check out my podcast where we discuss topics related to beauty and aesthetics.